Well, thank you for coming today, first of all. Um, a very brief introduction. My name is Richard Barry. Um, I'm a director of Real Time Engineers Limited who um, develop, maintain, and promote free RTOS. Quick agenda of what we're going to go through. First of all, um, we, don't, we don't have time to say what an RTOS is, I'm afraid, so I'm assuming that you're familiar with what real-time kernels are. I am going to briefly touch on why you might want to use one, because unless we're sure why we might want to use one, then um, you might, you know, the demonstration will be less relevant. If I can convince people, if you're not already convinced that sometimes you might want to use a real-time kernel, then I can show you um, later on in the presentation or the main part of the presentation actually hopefully how easy it is and we can actually see it running on some NXP hardware. So why, why might an RTOS be useful to you, right? Um, first of all, I would say not, not all applications warrant the use of a real-time kernel. You, you can make perfectly good designs using a super loop foreground background type architecture. Um, I've deliberately greyed these out. You, it, you're not supposed to read what's in this. The idea here is just to show that here's a piece of functionality with, with a state machine or a flow chart or something. Here's another piece of functionality. Here's another piece of functionality. <clears throat> and the microcontroller is just looping round and round, running this, running this, running this. There's interrupts going on. I think we're all familiar with this type of architecture. And for a lot of applications, that's that's perfectly adequate, especially the smaller applications. If there aren't any communication interfaces, there's no asynchronous interfaces and that sort of thing, it's perfectly acceptable, perfectly maintainable. But will it scale? Will it scale to larger applications? Or if you add functionality in, or if you change the hardware, is that kind of design going to make your life very difficult as the product evolves? as all products do. I'm sure anyone with more than a couple of years of experience will be familiar with that. So here are a few items that um, can be problematic trying to scale up a superloop type design. And here um, what we want to do is turn all these little grumpy faces into smiley faces. So things like tolerance of hardware change well, the superloop is not that tolerant. It's not particularly bad, but it, <coughs> if the rate at which you're looping is dependent on the hardware, the speed of the hardware, the clock, then it's not that great. Things like code reuse are very hard because your bits of functionality are very, very independent and interworked. I'm not going to go down the list of all of them, but I'm just trying to show you some, some of the attributes that we're trying to improve. And the problem, the problem here can be summed up by saying that there's, there's a big interdependency between what your application is trying to do functionally and how your application is running, um, you know, the timing of your application. So really what we want to do is, is break that to make our application much more maintainable. So we want to um, take the, the timing, if you like, uh, is one aspect that the real-time kernel can control and remove that from what we're trying to write functionally. So if we break our application up into separate tasks, different threads of execution if you like, then we might have a structure like this. Here's a periodic task. We want to delay until it's time to run again, perform some kind of function, control function, whatever, output the results, go back and delay again. What we have here for this delay is in a real-time kernel st uh, structure is to actually make a call to the real-time kernel and say, I don't want to run again until it's time to run again. The real-time kernel is then responsible for the timing and say, okay, now it's time to run again. I'm going to unblock this task. The task can run. So the structure of the task becomes very, very simple and you can rely on the real-time kernel to make sure that it runs the right tasks at the right time. So you can assign a priority to this and say this is, much, this is my primary functionality or this is my safety functionality or something like that. This is really important. This task over here, which is waiting for an interrupt and processing data, is maybe less important. Actually, probably a bad example because the interrupts are probably the most important. 
some kind of background processing, which is just a forever loop. That's not really important. So we'll assign that a low priority, that a medium priority, that really high priority. And then it's the kernel will make sure that that runs absolutely when it's supposed to. You can change the speed of the hardware, won't make a difference. You can add more code into this background task as the functionality grows as it inevitably does, it won't make a difference. This is still guaranteed to run. So it's, it's much more maintainable. Because you're relying on the services of the kernel to do all your signaling and timing and communication, and you're left with a autonomous, functionally cohesive tasks which are doing just uh, executing one very specific piece of functionality. So now if we look back at our um, attributes here, things like tolerance of hardware change, I've already said is very tolerant of hardware change. Code reuse becomes much easier because you don't have this interdependency between different piece of, pieces of the functionality. You can mix hard and soft real time just by assigning priorities and that sort of thing. I mean, that was, that was a, a very, very rapid go through as, as to why a kernel might be useful in some applications. So now I want to move on to say um, a little bit about FreeRTOS. What is FreeRTOS and the FreeRTOS Plus? And we'll start with a little bit of terminology because um, there is no, uh, there's no definitive description of what these terms actually mean, definition of these terms. So there are lots of different types of operating systems. So if you have a big operating system that has um, a file system in it, a command line interface, maybe TCP IP and that sort of thing, then that is really a real-time operating system. So although I free RTOS has RTOS in the name, it doesn't have all that. It does have a scheduler, as every operating system will, be it re real-time or non-real-time. And around it, it has a group of services. So there is a command line interface, there is inter-task communication, and that sort of thing. So um, really, FreeRTOS is what I'd call an executive. It has the scheduler, and it has a means of controlling the tasks that it's running, um, but it's not really a full-blown operating system. What makes it real-time? Now, if you have something like Linux, it's not a real-time system. We're talking about real-time systems here, and the difference really is in the scheduling algorithm. The scheduling algorithm has to make it deterministic. Real-time doesn't mean fast, it means deterministic. And in that, we achieve that, as I've already mentioned, by assigning priorities to tasks. So in this diagram, what it's supposed to show is time moving towards me here, and the colored lines are all the different tasks that are running. Here we have three application tasks, high, medium, and low priority. The idle task is just executing whenever there aren't any application tasks to run. And the idle task is created by the kernel itself when you start the scheduler. And the other tasks are created by the application writer. So here we can see there's a periodic task which is wanting to run and a high priority event task. So at this point here, the medium priority task is running. The task that we have assigned a much higher priority to suddenly needs to run. Maybe it's received a message from somewhere or it's um, received communication from an interrupt or something like that. And the kernel will immediately stop the medium priority task, run the high priority task. When the high priority task is finished, drop back down to the medium priority task and then eventually down to lower and eventually the idle when there's nothing else to run. So your application code doesn't need to know anything about that. You just write your application task code um, as, a single, it doesn't, as a single thread of execution. It doesn't know anything about what else is going on and the kernel takes care of that for you. This diagram just shows a little bit about where FreeRTOS fits so you're um, aware of exactly what it is. Um, this applicability scale is not really quantifiable, there's no numeric scale there, but basically what I'm saying is the further up here you are, the more applicable it is. Along this way is the processing power. So over here we have, I don't know, a 4-bit micro. At this end you have the Pentium class Intel kind of things. 
So down here, really, it's never appropriate to have a scheduler. Um, the more powerful the processor gets, the more appropriate it might become. Um, at this end, with where your Linux and your Windows embedded and that sort of thing is, um, the top end processors, memory managed and that sort of thing, well, that's not the right market either. But in the middle here, where we have microcontrollers with adequate RAM, um, FreeOTOS takes about absolute minimum of 70 words of RAM per task. Um, a task which is doing anything useful would take more than that. The scheduler takes about 200 bytes of RAM, so it's insignificant. Um, and, and enough flash, again, the build, the footprint of FreeRTOS is between about five and a half and nine K of flash, so very, very small. And that fits very, very nicely on microcontrollers like the, um, L, the LPC 1768, 18XX, 34XX, where you've got lots of communication interfaces, enough flash, enough RAM to do something actually quite complex. So that's really the, the market it's in. Tell you a little bit about FreeRTOS itself, just to give you a bit of confidence in the product. It, it is effectively, other than the fact it's given away for free, it is a commercial product. I mean, it's developed in a, a very um, professional way, strictly quality controlled. You know, we used to write aerospace software at one time, so um, that's something we know quite a lot about. It's extremely robust and it is supported. What we've tried to do is look at all reasons why people might not want to use free software. I've, I've, no, I've named a few there and try to remove them. So in effect, what you're getting is um, a, the same experience as if you were using a fully commercial product, you're just not paying for it. And because of that, we think that's a very, very compelling um, value proposition for people. So it's become incredibly popular. Last year alone, it was downloaded 103,000 times that we can track, okay? So it'll be more than that, really. And the last three years, 2011, 12, and 13, it's come top in class in the EE Times Embedded Surveys for the kernel being used in applications and the kernel considered for use in applications. It would have come top before 2011 as well, but it wasn't included in uh, before that wasn't included in the survey. Also, uh, I, should, I should have mentioned at the beginning, there is a commercial version as well. The commercial version gives you legal indemnification and it gives you dedicated support rather than the support that's provided um, pro bono. The, um, the reason I like to mention that here is that this really makes it a very, very low risk option. You can start your application using free RTOS take it all the way through to productization and ship products um, without ever speaking to us, that's fine. But if you're a bit concerned, well, what, what happens if I can't get it working correctly or um, I need a bit of extra support or in particular, I need legal indemnification because my company just won't put software into our product unless somewhere there is a contract with a responsible person, then you can always buy a very low cost um, commercial license at any time, at the beginning of your development, in the middle of your development, at the end. Now, most people don't need to, of course, but there is that sort of safety blanket for you. And normally, someone by now has said, um, but can I, even though I keep mentioning you can put it into products, but can I really put it into my product? So, um, the way it's licensed is that the FreeRTOS source code remains open source. So, if you improve anything in the kernel or add functionality, I should say, because you couldn't possibly improve it, then, um, then that remains open source. So your application code, be it a driver or middleware or just pure application code that just uses the kernel through the API can remain completely closed source. There's no contamination there. It's also under constant development here. This is one of the, the latest features that we've put in, which is specifically for low power applications. So I've already mentioned, this, this diagram is the same as the previous one in, in um, style. We have the idle task down here. At some point, 
an interrupt occurs, the scheduler runs, it says, because of that interrupt, I need to run this task. The task is executed. The task then says, I don't need to run again until the interrupt occurs again. The scheduler runs again, and the idle task carries on running. And now you can use the idle task as a very, very simple way of knowing there's nothing to do. Let's put the processor into low power state. You, get, you, you sort of get that automatically just from using a kernel. But in um, most real-time kernels, you have to have a periodic tick interrupt, which are represented by these lines. Every time there's a tick, you come out of low power mode, execute the kernel for a very short period, just so it can manage, maintain time, and then drop back down to the idle task. And you do that repeatedly. So although you, although you can massively improve power consumption very, very easily by using the idle task, you can't get the optimum power consumption because you're periodically waking up. So what we've done is add a feature where th these two diagrams are very simple, but uh, very similar, sorry. But if you watch on the next diagram, what we've done is remove these executions so that the idle task carries on completely uninterrupted until something else actually needs to be processed, actually needs to be managed. So this is what we call the tick, tickless idle. You just turn the, turn the tick interrupt off. You also um, like to mention there is an ecosystem around free RTOS because it's um, so popular. There are a lot of people supporting it. Um, lots of middleware vendors and that sort of thing will, will give you uh, middleware for free RTOS. <coughs> the, if you buy a commercial license, you can also buy very high quality middleware, USB stacks, TCP IP, that sort of thing. Um, in the FreeRTOS Plus is the ecosystem showcase. Some of these products are our own, like the I.O. The command line interface, um, <coughs> the UDP IP stack. There are TCP IP libraries you can buy. They're um, inter-niche or inter-niche, as they say in the, in the US, um, libraries or inter-niche uh, products. But as an entry point, rather than buying the source code, you can get the same product as a library uh, to make, make the cost a lot lower, and that's ported to seven, LPC 1768 and LPC 1769, I believe. And there's, there's training and um, encryption and a very nice trace tool, which I've got a, a screenshot of here to help with your um, optimization. People often think of trace tools as just being debugging aids. In actual fact, um, some of our biggest successes with this trace tool of being helping people to optimize their code as well. Okay, now we're going to come on to how you would actually use FreeRTOS. How, how do you go about using FreeRTOS? Well, first of all, the FreeRTOS website is the place to start. Um, it's not very pretty, okay? It, it's written by engineers for engineers. It's not a, it's not a marketing website. At the top there, you'll see the first arrow pointing to the quick starts guide. That will try and, or tries to help you navigate around this to find the information you need. The download link, most important. If you look at web stats of how people navigate this website, they normally go to the front page and then head straight for the download link and, and miss out all the other information there. Uh, every port, it supports 33 architectures. <coughs> Cortex M3 being counted as one architecture. There's every, every port has a set of, or one or more, I should say, demo projects. If you're using it on an LPC with IAR, go and find a demo project that has LPC with IAR, and you'll have an environment that you can just open the project and it will build. If you have the same hardware as well, then it will even just run straight away. If you have different hardware, you may need to port it slightly to different hardware. So the, the different chip variant with a slightly different memory map or the LEDs on a different port pin or something like that. But there's a whole set of demo projects and there's the API reference as well. I would encourage people to buy the API reference as a PDF, but it's on the web as well. Everything we try and do um, is, is geared to making things as simple as possible to use. So there are actually only three source files that you need for the core kernel functionality. There's a third file which you need to port it to a specific chip. So that's just four 
different files you need. You also need to provide um, a configuration file called freeartosconfig.h. There are loads of examples of those. And um, you also need to provide a memory management function. There are four, there are four provided in the download. Um, very much of the opinion that different applications need different memory management. You know, a lot of applications will create everything at the beginning and then it will never create or delete anything again, in which case you don't really need a sophisticated memory management. So there's one version that will do that for you. There's another version which has uh, memory, co memory coalescence, if I've said that correctly, where if you um, create and delete memory very rapidly, it will try and um, match up adjacent blocks so you don't get memory fragmentation. So we keep that in the port layer because we don't think that there is one solution that fits everything. In fact, we're very, very sure there's not one solution that fits everything. There's also an FAQ. I highlight this page because it's relevant to the LPC um, 1718 um, range. There is a, a full interrupt nesting model. And that means that you have to set, firstly, how you want your nesting model to work, because there is a range of interrupts that are never disabled at all. Um, but you have to tell it which range you want to be never disabled. And then on the cortex itself, you have to set the interrupt priority of every interrupt that you're using to make sure it fits into the correct range. And this is where most people go wrong, first of all. Um, we try and highlight this absolutely everywhere. We, so there is a, a page on the website specifically about how to set the interrupt priorities. I'm then going to show you a little bit of code. So hopefully um, we'll make this, uh, or hopefully emphasize how simple it is to use, especially compared to some competitive products maybe. <coughs> Creating a, a task, it's just a C function, that's all it is, there's nothing magic about it. It has to have this prototype, returns void, takes a void star parameter. So it is, um, you can pass in anything you like. And you can pass in a pointer to a structure or you could use that to just to pass in an integer, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Normally done as a, a forever loop. Um, so here you're, wait, you're waiting to receive something so this is an API function. If it starts with Q, then it's in Q.C. If it starts with task, then it's in task.C, so you can find the function should you need to. Um, here we're just saying receive from this queue. That's where we're putting what we're receiving. That's how long we're willing to wait for it. If you wait, you don't use any CPU time. Process the message and carry on. In FreeRTOS, you can't, if there was a break statement in here, you can't just um, come out of the function and drop off the end. You must delete the task so things get cleaned up nicely. Uh, here there is a task delete function. If you pass in null, it means delete me, delete the calling task. If you pass in the handle of another task, it will, it will go away and delete that task instead. Uh, there's another example. This is just showing a periodic task. So um, here we're saying delay until here's the last time that this task was executed and this is the frequency at which I want to execute. So that function will wake up this task that many ticks, tick, tick is a measure of time, okay, in an R task, that many ticks after that time and it will also update this variable so you can just call this function repeatedly and run with very accurate, um, uh, very accurate period. Creating a task, this is actually the most complex function by far. I, I should have said with the queue functions actually, the, um, the queuing mechanism is designed to be as flexible as possible. You can do whatever you, whatever you like with it. You can pass pointers to buffers or you can pass buffers or you can just pass integers or whatever. So creating a task, the first parameter is the name of the task. That's the function that you've just seen me implement in the previous two slides. Um, the stack, which the size of the stack that you want the task to have. There is um, stack overflow detection in there. A parameter that you're passing in, this, in this case is just passing in zero or null. The priority you want to run at, um, priority zero is the lowest priority. 
lower numbers for lower priorities seem to make sense. Top priority is actually configurable. We looked at, well, we looked at the file name, not the actual file, FreeRTOS config. In there, you set the maximum priority. And tasks can share priorities, that's not a problem. If you want a handle to the task, then you pass in a variable here and you'll get the handle out. If the handle is of no interest to you, you can just save your time and pass null in there and it, it won't do anything. And starting the scheduler, we just uh, call the start scheduler function. So again, it's defined in task.c, it's defined in task.c. Okay, so now we're going to look at running, free, actually running FreeRTOS on there. And I, I understand I'm only giving you little bytes of information as we go along, but we just kind of progress along like this to actually look at running it. So on the FreeRTOS website, there are a couple of um, comprehensive demos. This runs on the LPC Expresso baseboard. It uses the LPC Expresso IDE, which is a free IDE. We're going to use that in a minute, so you'll see that. Um, this is running the command line interface and the I.O., which are dual licensed products. Un unlike FreeRTOS, they're um, either pure open source um, or commercially licensed, but on NXP hardware, you can use them with the commercial license for free. So um, you, you don't have to use the open source license, but you also don't have to pay anything. And this is running, uh, there's another one here which is runs um, the Chan FAT system, actual file system, a little web server, a little Telnet like server with some peripherals. So you can just go away and download that. Um, this is a, the FreeRTOS Plus website, the IO product, there's a download link. This is the demo, this is the project which we're actually going to run ourselves now. This is on some NGX hardware. This is a very low cost board. Um, I, I can't remember how much it costs, but I think it's sub $100. Um, and you can just buy that from, uh, you know, Element 14 or Mauser or some, somewhere like that. So we're going to demonstrate that now. And I'm going to bring up the LPC Expresso tool. Now this is running the um, UDP stack, uh, which normally you would have a DHCP server to get an IP address. In this case, go away. In this case, um, I'm just running it on a point-to-point -point network, so I've set the DHCP to zero. It's just a configuration option. Um, if there's time, I can show you a little bit more of the code of, from this. But this is, again, something you can just download from the FreeRTOS website uh, and try yourselves. In, in here, you can see there's, there's the FreeRTOS source code with the list queue and tasks. We're also using the timers.c in this as well, which adds a little bit of extra functionality the UDP IP stack, the command line interface, some commands that we've um, implemented, which I'm going to demonstrate to you, and a um, few examples here. This is using um, a USB CDC for the IO on the command line interface. Plug that in. This is the LPC Expresso environment, by the way, here. If, you, if your application is less than 128K, this is a free, free tool. What we'll do is just start that running. There's a, for those of you that can see down here, there's a LED flashing on there now, which is uh, the normal, just I mean, that's that's just done so you can actually see the application is running, give you a bit of visual feedback. And what I should be able to do is open up this command line interface. Eleven or sixteen? What do you think? Let's try that one. Fifty-fifty uh, chance. Got it right. Um, as standard, you always get a help function. Help is the only one you get built in and then you can 
specify your own commands and just register them with the command line interface. Again, if you're using NXP hardware, this command line interface is free. And um, let's see, I can do IP config. And this is the, this is the static IP address that I've given it. If you were using DHCP, you might want to do that to see what, what the address was. Um, this particular example is running, actually I can show you that on here. If I show task stats here, here's our command line interface. I'm running two UDP tasks, both of which are sending to a Echo server, which happens to be running on my laptop as well. I have to run it on my laptop because it's the only other thing on the network. Um, so that's send, sending out echo commands, waiting for the reply, sending another one, waiting for the reply. Both of those tasks are doing that. The idle task we've mentioned already, time of service task, the UDP IP stack itself, and the um, a deferred interrupt for the ethernet interrupts. Um, I haven't got time to explain that, unfortunately, but for the, for the six of you that come out with a book, then that's explained a little bit more in there. So what we can do then is view the traffic going backwards and forwards in Wireshark. This is what, for those of you that aren't familiar, this is a, a packet sniffer. It just tells me what's on the ethernet network. So here we can see um, echo requests going out and replies coming back. So there is actually now a, a lot of network traffic going backwards and forwards. And we can also um, try pinging this as well. I have a little batch file because I, this is a high resolution ping and I can never remember the command line. So there's a little batch file there which, which can also ping it. So I can blast lots of ping messages at it as well. And then we can see those going backwards and forwards in the packet sniffer as well. So let's stop that. Now, if I come back to the command line interface, if I can find it. IP debug stats, we can see here that we've sent 18,400 packets. The way I have the command interpreter set up at the moment, I can just press enter to run the, next, run the previous command again. And now you can see we've sent 19,800 packets. So this is all going, all that ethernet traffic's going on in the background. The MAC interrupt is um, a very high priority in managing it. The command line interface is um, slightly lower priority, but you can see how everything is running. The command line interface is, is just um, a very um, compact piece of code. It doesn't know anything about anything else that's doing, that is going on but you can see how the kernel is managing both the UDP tasks, this task, and the, the interrupts and everything. So hope, hopefully that's, uh, if, you, if you actually get to look at this code, you can see if you were trying to do that without the real-time kernel, it, it would be very hard. Harder or less maintainable. Really, it's about maintainability, if you like. I'm also, I'm also going to um, show you that there is a, a plugin for FreeRTOS as well in this tool. So here you can see um, you can see garbage figures here. Ex uh, uh, excuse those. I think that happened yesterday as well. Actually, I need to look at that. But um, if I turn this on, it will tell you how much stack you have free, which is Im important debugging information. Um, it will tell you the state of the task, uh, the um, start and end of the stack, the priority, and the name. The name of the task is only used for debugging. The kernel doesn't use that at all. You can call it whatever you like. Okay, back to the presentation, which is, you'll be glad to know, nearly at an end. The, um, the next thing to talk about is some of the other resources that are provided to you uh, by NXP. So if you go to this website here, LPC Open, you'll find this package um, from NXP, which has a whole load of stuff in it. The peripheral drivers for uh, a whole range of um, NXP MCUs, uh, very, very useful. USB drivers with many different classes. I think we'll see some of the classes on slides further down. Uh, a couple of graphics libraries. Um, there's the, uh, the lightweight graphics, the SWIM, 
Also, there is the uh, MWIN package from Sega, which if for um, in library form on NXP chips, I think you can use that for free as well. So there's an arrangement there for you. So you can get a very high quality graphics package, um, get access to it for no cost. Um, there are examples in there that use free RTOS, but it's not particularly free RTOS centric. Um, there are lots of examples in there that don't use an RTOS at all. Has the lightweight um, stack. Oh yeah, the graphics library I just mentioned. It uses the Chan uh, file system. I should say that, um, or I should have said, if I was a better marketing person and not an engineer, that um, we actually have our own file system now as well. Um, well, I mean, you, can, you can read those yourselves. Ba basically, the idea with these things is to get you started very, very quickly, to give you something which works already um, that you can then either use as it is or develop further or uh, put, put into your applications. Um, you can see there, there's quite a comprehensive range of USB drivers, including things like audio drivers. So it's, it's not just the you know, it's not just the CDC class. And, and the, uh, the structure of it, how everything uh, is packaged together. I also want to, uh, the, there is another slide here which just shows um, an application. So here we're actually running on a LPC 4300. So there's uh, a project for the M0 core and a project for the M4 core. Um, and for that, I've, I've also selected this. So this is, I should have also said that this runs on multiple different standard development platforms. In this case, I was running on the Kyle um, MCB 4357. Um, and I've included the, the USB library out of LPC Open on both platforms. I've also included a board support package for, for that Kyle board as well. So you can see there that I've, st I've started my application. In fact, this is, a stand this is a standard one, which is also in, in LPC Open. But if I was starting my own application, I would create a project here. And I would say, I need USB HID class or something like that. I'd go to LPC Open. I can import that into here, and I've got access to it. Um, or I need a board support package because I want to do something on the board. Import that and I've got it available. So now all I need to do is firstly look at the example to see how to use it, how do I call the functions in there, and then just write my application code without having to worry about that stuff. So um, thank you very much for coming.